What a great turnout. I, I just kept getting more and more nervous as more and more people came, but uh, thank you all for coming. And what an honor it is to be asked to, to join you today. I appreciate it. Um, I decided to talk on uh, what I call Theodore Roosevelt in Dakota, fact, fiction, fallacy. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstandings about Roosevelt in, in uh, North Dakota, and it's, it's kind of fun to explore what uh, is accurate and what is not. And uh, I'll start out by saying that several prominent Western writers, including North Dakota's own Louis L'Amour, have been criticized for including, quote, improbable characters in their novels. In his own defense, Louis L'Amour once pointed to Theodore Roosevelt and the Marquis de Mores, among others, to demonstrate that the West had no improbable characters, only incredible characters. And th those, two, those two certainly were uh, quite incredible. Theodore Roosevelt is undeniably the most famous resident North Dakota's ever had. He was not born here, he did not die here, and the total number of days he spent here totals less than one full year. Yet something transformative and almost magical happened to Roosevelt in the Badlands of North Dakota. He referred to it often and sincerely in public speeches and in private conversations. His time in North Dakota, he said, made him who he was. It literally enabled him to rise to the presidency of the United States. On occasion, he even explained how it changed his life. When he visited Medora on September 16, 1900, when he was on his campaign tour for the McKinley-Roosevelt presidential ticket, he said, here the romance of my life began. I had studied a lot about men and things before I saw you fellows, but it was only after I came out here that I began to know anything or to measure men right. At Fargo on September 5, 1910, after his presidency, Roosevelt said, I can never begin to say what I owe to North Dakota. I have lived with the ranchman. I have worked with him. I have worked with men who work with his hands. I have worked with men of small means, with the typical American. And I know just how they feel because I have been in their place and I feel that way myself. On the same occasion, he spoke of, quote, Medora in the western part of your state where I spent the happiest and most profitable years of my entire life, which is interesting because, as I say, that was after his presidency, and he's looking back to Medora, saying they were the happiest and most profitable years of his entire life. Senator Albert Fall of New Mexico wrote that during a private conversation the next year in 1911, Roosevelt told him that if he could retain the memory of only one chapter in his life, it would be his ranching days out west. Uh, to use a Citizen Kane analogy, if you're familiar with that movie, that was T.R.'s Rosebud. T.R.'s first impression of the Badlands, however, were anything but promising. The 24-year-old New Yorker, already a published author and a rising New York politician, stepped off the Northern Pacific passenger car at the ramshackle town of Little Missouri shortly after midnight on September 8, 1883. After he finally located the building that was euphemistically called a hotel, he emerged at daylight into a country unlike anything he had ever seen. Taking pen in hand that day, he dashed off a letter to his pregnant 22-year-old wife, Alice, saying, it is a very desolate place, high, barren hills, scantily clad with coarse grass, here and there in sheltered places a few stunted cottonwood trees. There is very little water, and what there is is so bitter as to be almost undrinkable. It is nearly poisonous, so alkaline that the very cow's milk tastes of it. So uh, his first impression was not, not that great. Unknown to T.R. and everyone else at that time, he was the third U.S. president to visit Little Missouri that week. Six days earlier, President Chester Arthur's party had stopped briefly on their return from Yellowstone Park to Washington, D.C. Well, at Little Missouri, they had chatted with the Marquis de Mores and his father-in-law, the New York millionaire, Louis von Hoffman. Three days later, the party of Henry, Henry Villard, president of the Northern Pacific, paused to view the spectacular scenery as they traveled west to the Golden Spike Ceremony in Montana. Villard's guest of honor was former president <coughs> Ulysses S. Grant. 
And three days after that, Roosevelt stepped off the train. In just 18 years, almost to the day, Roosevelt would become the youngest man ever to assume the presidency. Despite his initial unfavorable impressions, T.R. had come to kill a buffalo. And with a local guide, Joe Ferris, he quickly set off up the Little Missouri River on his quest. Within a few short days, as evidenced by his letters, his health improved, his constitution strengthened, and he became mesmerized by the raw, rugged beauty of the Badlands. By the time he returned to Little Missouri two weeks later, having gotten his buffalo, he had largely shed his foppish demeanor and his snobbish attitude, and he had committed to buy a cattle ranch to be managed by Joe's brother, Sylvain Ferris, and William Merrifield. Theodore Roosevelt in North Dakota had become one and inseparable. Roosevelt was a romantic. In the still unsettled West, he saw himself as one with his boyhood heroes, Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, Kit Carson. In his writings of life in the West, T.R. emphasized the independence and individuality of the citizen, where respect and dignity were earned, regardless of name or background. In fact, T.R. overcame his background to be accepted as an equal by the, quote, typical American of the West. That was a recognition he cherished. T.R. was a prolific writer of letters, articles, and books. In his writings, he waxed exuberantly about the Badlands and his life there, bringing the region national attention. His impressions and stories have been repeated and reprinted ever since, usually uncritically, even by his biographers. And therein lies the danger for T.R., reflective, reflective of the Mark Twain era, often wrote for entertainment, not for literal history. T.R. and other writers have offered details on his Dakota life which raise and leave puzzling questions, such as, did he attempt to ride with vigilantes? Did he and the flamboyant Marquis de Mores almost fight a duel? Did he use his fist to subdue a threatening gunman? Was he indeed a working Western lawman? How many men did he arrest, and where? Even before T.R. became a national figure, some area residents urged moderation in accepting his stories at face value. As early as 1888, a Wisconsin correspondent traveling through the area on the Northern Pacific wrote back to the Eau Claire News, saying, there are large cattle ranches in some parts of this region, and some good specimens of the average cowboy were seen at Medora, on the Little Missouri, where the Marquis de Mores is operating. Theodore Roosevelt of New York, in his Century articles, has assisted in directing public attention to this region, although it is said that considerable allowance should be made for the exuberance of his imagination. The Jamestown Weekly Alert on the Northern Pacific Line often sought out prominent passengers during their train stop over at Jamestown. In 1893, its reporter questioned Howard Eaton, owner of the famous Custer Trail Ranch, who had been in the Badlands since 1880. Howard Eaton was questioned about the already burgeoning mythology of the West. The Jamestown paper said, readers will remember that civil service reformer Roosevelt of New York a few years ago wrote a series of articles for Century Magazine in which his explorations on life as a Western cowboy were graphically portrayed. Any old time stockman, says Mr. Eaton, who reads the Roosevelt articles will smile to himself at the power of imagination they display and the wide divergence of many of his escapades and adventures from facts. In 1899, the Dickinson Press took its turn at criticizing, at critiquing it's lit the literary adventures of its former neighbor. The Dickinson Press said, it is also related of Teddy that he possessed all the cleverness of Anthony Hope in making a strong calcium light follow himself through most of his narratives. Thus, in one of his books on life in the Badlands, he tells of a desperate shooting affray at Medora, which he did not witness, as he was at that time en route to the scene of action as was, and was swimming his horse across the river holding his rifle over his head. One old fellow whom I ran across at Medora recalled this story and stamped it as a most wonderful feat. The simple act of braving the raging Little Missouri River on horseback was not what provoked astonishment. It was not the narrator's forethought in holding his rifle up to keep his powder dry. The real cause of admiration vouchsafed after various questionings 
was the fact that on the same day that shooting had occurred, quote, Mickelson had crossed the river on the ice with 4,400 pounds on his wagon. <laughs> the press concluded with a very apt observation. But for all that, Teddy has a niche of honor in every household in the Badlands, and his perilous passage of the river is told as but a good joke that grows better as its subject mounts higher on the ladder of fame. During the 1880s, Theodore Roosevelt was not the most famous man in the Badlands. That distinction belonged to the colorful and flamboyant Marquis de Mores, the founder of the town of Medora, who named it after his wife. The Marquis and Roosevelt shared some unique parallels. They were born the same year. They arrived in the Badlands the same year, at age 24, both very young. In fact, a lot of the men who uh, we read about in the early days of Medora were kids in their 20s, you know, just trying to make a name for themselves. It's always amazing to find out how young these these people were. Both Roosevelt and the Marquis were born to privilege and were insanely ambitious. Their personalities kept them from becoming close, however. They rarely associated personally, and in fact, these two busy travelers were rarely in the same time, in the same place at the same time. From its very beginning, the town of Medora has become obscured by myth. The ancient tradition is that the town was founded by the Marquis on April Fool's Day, 1883. Yet Demores did not leave Minneapolis for the West until the next day. <laughs> tradition has the Marquis pitching his tent and immediately breaking a bottle of champagne over the tent peg, christening the town Medora for his young bride. Yet the Marquis had no need for a tent. He lived quite comfortably in his own private railroad car. And as late as August of that year, he was explaining to the press that his new town was still part of Little Missouri, the existing settlement on the opposite bank of the river. Not until September 16th, five months after the Marquis' arrival, was it first reported by the Mandan Daily Pioneer that the name of the new town on the east side of the Little Missouri River at the crossing of the railroad is to be Medora, with Medora misspelled. By then, the Marquis had already killed a man, or at least he was accused of doing so. On June 26, he and a group of his men had engaged three local hunters in a gun battle a mile west of Little Missouri, and a popular young hunter named William Riley Lufsey was killed. The Marquis faced two preliminary hearings at Mandan, the nearest court of law, but he was not charged with a crime. The Lefsey affair smoldered for two more years and caught flame again in August 1885 when the Marquis was formally indicted for, for Lefsey's murder. The celebrity murder case quickly became fodder for the national press. The following sensational news item was broadcast widely. It said, about a year ago, the Marquis made a verbal contract with Theodore Roosevelt, the New York politician who owns an immense cattle ranch near Medora, Dakota agreeing to purchase a quantity of cattle. Roosevelt had the stock driven down to the point agreed upon when the Marquis declined to receive them and declared he had made no such contract. Mr. Roosevelt stormed a little, but finally subsided and gave orders to his men not to sell any cattle to the Marquis or to transact any business with him. The relations between the Marquis and Mr. Roosevelt have since been somewhat strained. While chafing under arrest at Bismarck, even if it were, were a loose confinement, the Marquis referenced these news reports in a hurried note to Roosevelt dated September 3rd. The Marquis wrote, My dear Roosevelt, my principle is to take the bull by the horns. Joe Ferris is very active against me and has been instrumental in getting me indicted by furnishing money and witnesses and hunting them up. The papers also published very stupid accounts of our quarreling. I sent you the paper to New York. Is this done by your orders? I thought you my friend. If you are my enemy, I want to know it. I am always on hand, as you know, and between gentlemen, it is easy to settle matters of this sort directly. Yours very truly, Morez. The Marquis then added a mollifying postscript. I hear the people want to organize the county. I am opposed to it for one year more at least. Roosevelt received this letter while at Medora for a meeting of the Little Missouri River Stockmen's Association on September 5th. His reaction indicates that he was well aware of the Marquis' rumored record as a duelist in Europe. 
The next day, Roosevelt crafted a masterfully diplomatic reply to the Marquis. Roosevelt wrote, most emphatically, I am not your enemy. If I were, you would know it, for I would be an open one, and would not have asked you to my house nor gone to yours. As your final words, however, seem to imply a threat, it is due to myself to say that the statement is not made through any fear of possible consequences to me. I too, as you know, am always on hand, and never ready to hold myself accountable in any way for anything I have said or done. Yours very truly, Theodore Roosevelt. The Marquis' answer does not survive, although Roosevelt would declare later that it was an apology. In all his voluminous writings, T.R. made only a couple of references to the Marquis de Mores. In an 1893 letter, Roosevelt wrote of a political rival who reminded him of someone else. Roosevelt wrote, he was very much like the Marquis that time he wrote me that note when we were at the ranch. After he had carried his bullying to a certain point, I brought him up with a round turn. And when he threatened, I told him to go right ahead. I was no brawler, but that I was always ready to defend myself in any way. And that, moreover, I would guarantee to do it, too. Then he backed off. Roosevelt spoke again of the Marquis in 1898, while in Cuba during the Spanish-American War. Kenneth Harris, a former Black Hills official and newspaper editor, was at that time a Chicago news correspondent. Because of his former residence in Western Dakota in the 1880s, it must have been Kenneth Harris himself who tossed a, a loaded question to Roosevelt. Harris wrote, I believe that there is more storytelling around a soldier's campfire than in any other place in the world. Colonel Roosevelt is a good storyteller, and whether he is talking of his little Missouri ranch experiences or of the humors of a New York police court, he always has a large and interested audience. One night he was speaking of the Marquis de Mores. Roosevelt said it was like living with a cotton-mouthed adder to be with him. <laughs> Exciting and interesting, but not pleasant. An intensely spectacular man, dramatic. While T.R. was convinced of the Marquis' malicious intent in challenging him to a duel, Others who knew the Marquis scoffed at the idea that he had issued a formal challenge to Roosevelt. If the Marquis had meant it, they said, he would never have backed down. And that was a trait shared by both men. If not a duelist, T.R. was in fact an accomplished boxer, having trained at Harvard. In 1888, he first wrote publicly of what would become a classic tale of his Western career. Roosevelt wrote, I was never shot at maliciously but once. That, that was on the occasion when I had to pass the night in a little frontier hotel where the bar room occupied the whole lower floor and was in consequence a place where everyone, drunk or sober, had to sit. My assailant was neither a cowboy nor a bona fide bad man, but a broad-headed ruffian of cheap and commonplace type who had for the moment terrorized the other men in the bar room these being mostly sheep herders and small grangers. The fact that I wore glasses, together with my evident desire to avoid a fight, apparently gave him the impression, a mistaken one, that I would not resent an injury. In, labor, in later elaborating on this incident, T.R. caused time and place to lose their meaning. Three of his major biographers, Herman Hagedorn, Carlton Putnam, and Edmund Morris, strived mightily to reconcile T.R.'s various accounts of his encounter with the barroom bully, and they all arrived at differing conclusions. Where the punch-out occurred depends upon which of T.R.'s accounts you read and believe. Whether it occurred in June 1884, August 1884, or April 1885 depends upon which of his prominent biographers you read and believe. So Roosevelt was very vague in, in some of his tales. T.R. wrote of other adventures in unnamed frontier towns. His 1913 autobiography contained one well-known story. Roosevelt wrote, On one such occasion, I reached a little cow town long after dark, stabled my horse in an empty outbuilding, and when I reached the hotel, was informed in response to my request for a bed that I could have the last one left, as there was only one other man in it. <laughs> the room to which I was shown contained two double beds. One contained two men fast asleep, and the other only one man who was also asleep. This man proved to be a, a friend, one of the Bill Joneses whom I knew. 
I undressed according to the fashion of the day and place, that is, I put my trousers, boots, chaps, and gun down beside the bed, and I turned in. A couple of hours later, I was awakened by the door being thrown open and a lantern flashed in my face, the light gleaming on the muzzle of a cocked 45. Another man said to the lantern bearer, it ain't him. The next moment, my bedfellow was covered with two guns and was addressed. Now, Bill, don't make a fuss. Come along with us. I'm not thinking of making a fuss, said Bill. That's right, was the answer. We're your friends. We don't want to hurt you. We just want you to come along. You know why. And Bill pulled on his trousers and boots and walked out with the men. Up to this time, there had not been a sound from the other bed. Now a match was scratched, a candle was lit, and one of the men in the other bed looked around the room. At this point, I committed a breach of etiquette by asking questions. I wonder why they took Bill, I said. There was no answer, so I repeated, I wonder why they took Bill. Well, finally said the man with the candle dryly, I reckon they wanted him. And with that, he blew out the candle and the conversation ceased. <laughs> Later, I discovered that Bill had, in a flit of, fit of place, playfulness, held up the Northern Pacific train at a nearby station by shooting at the feet of the conductor to make him dance. This was purely a joke on Bill's part, but the Northern Pacific people possessed a less robust sense of humor. And on their complaint, the United States Marshal was sent after Bill on the ground that by delaying the train, he had interfered with the mails. This train holdup was indeed a famous regional event. On February 26, 1885, three young 3-7 three cowboys were on a spree at the little town of Mingusville, which was later renamed Weibo seven miles over the Montana line from Dakota. Their hilarity culminated that evening by attempting to make train conductor Joseph Clark dance by firing 10 to 15 shots at his feet. Clark was not amused and was still fuming when the train reached Glendive, 30 miles down the line, some 15 minutes behind schedule. There, Clark reported the incident to his superior, who made complaint to the local sheriff, Henry Tuttle, the railroad provided an engine and a caboose for Sheriff Tuttle and five deputies to proceed to Mingusville to do battle with the rampaging outlaws. When they arrived in Mingusville, the officers located three drunken, sleepy cowboys, 29-year-old Jack Tisdale, 19-year-old Bill Jones, and Julius Klein. Admitting to having had a bit of fun, the three young men were immediately arrested and taken to Glendive. The three defendants were soon charged with obstructing the U.S. mails and were released on a bail of $500 each. Pretty heavy fine for cowboys, but it was paid by their employer, the 3-7 Ranch. Bill Jones later stood trial and was found guilty, while the other two men pleaded guilty. All received heavy fines. Now recall that TR said he was sharing the cot with Bill Jones when Jones was arrested. In reality, when this Mingusville incident occurred in February 1885, TR was back home in New York. He had gone east two months earlier, and he would not return until two months later. <laughs> T.R. and the Marquis de Moras are intertwined again in the popular legend that they both wanted desperately to ride with vigilantes in 1884. While never claiming a personal role, T.R. does refer several times in his writings to the actions of vigilantes. A vigilante movement to combat the growing rustler menace in the region was already being discussed when T.R first became a ranchman in 1883, but it did not materialize until the following year. Its guiding spirit was Cattle King Granville Stewart of Montana, president of the Montana Stock Growers Association. The Little Missouri cattlemen, still unorganized, were affiliated with the Montana ranchers. This shadowy group of vigilantes came to be contempor contemporaneously known as the Montana Stranglers. They burst upon the scene in the first week of July, 1884, and they, or splinter groups, spent a few busy months dispensing summary justice on suspected stock thieves. It is written that the Marquis and Roosevelt beseeched Granville Stewart to allow them to ride with his vigilantes. The origin of this tale is difficult to determine, but the earliest published reference I have found is Herman Hagedorn's Roosevelt in the Badlands from 1921. Hagedorn's source was apparently Granville Stewart's widowed second wife, Belle, whom he married in 1890, years after the vigilantes rode. 
Hagedorn attempted to shoehorn the alleged meeting of T.R. and the Marquis with Granville Stewart into T.R.'s itinerary that summer of 1884, writing that the young Dakota firebrands made a special visit to Stewart to plead with, with him to be allowed to ride with his enforcers. This meeting, said Hagedorn, must have occurred, quote, during the last days of June. That was the only period that fit Roosevelt's schedule. Hagedorn declared that the Marquis and Roosevelt had journeyed to Glendive, Montana to make their appeal to Granville Stewart. It must be noted that a later TR biographer, Carlton Putnam, had the meeting occurring at Miles City, not Glendive. Stewart, said Hagedorn, was unimpressed by their passion and turned them down because, in paraphrase, they were too well known and they talked too much. So did such a dramatic meeting happen? The evidence indicates it did not. No contemporary evidence of such a journey has been found, and the confusion in location, whether Glendive or Miles City, does not bode well for the truth of the story. Most importantly, while tailoring the date to fit Roosevelt's calendar, Hagedorn failed to take note of the Marquis' busy schedule. During this time, the Marquis was again on an eastern journey of several weeks' duration. He had left Medora June 10th, the day after T.R. arrived. The Marquis returned to Medora late on June 27th, but he left again the next morning for the east. Roosevelt himself went east. I don't know if I pointed east or not. But, uh, Roosevelt himself went east two days later on June 30th and would not return until the last day of July, by which time the bulk of the vigilante work had been done. Thus, it is doubtful that the Marquis and Roosevelt even saw each other until late summer. If they did meet in June, it could only have been once or twice in passing. The documented travels of these two Medora men that season simply do not allow any chance for them to have rendezvoused with Granville Stewart in Montana. The story of their expressed desire to ride with a lynch mob at least as reported by Herman Hagedorn, is demonstrably false. It did not happen. And again, uh, after studying the, the schedule of both men, the Marquis and Roosevelt, they were rarely in the same place at the same time. They, they, uh, and when they were together, they rarely associated. So they did not have much to do in common, really. Even without this definite evidence, rationality dictates that a novice ranchman like T.R. on only a second brief visit to the Badlands could hardly have expected such an intimate audience with one of the most powerful men in Montana, Granville Stewart. Despite his accomplishments back east, T.R. simply did not yet have a credible voice among the leading cattlemen of the region, especially on such a sensitive subject as vigilanteism. That would change, of course, but only with time. Not until two months later would T.R. feel confident enough to write to his sister, quote, these Westerners have now pretty well accepted me as one of their own. Although T.R. did not originate the myth that he wanted to ride with a lynch mob, he did much to portray himself as an intrepid Western lawman and outlaw buster. Probably T.R.'s most famous exploit in Dakota was his pursuit in March and April 1886 of the three miscreants who had stolen his boat. T.R. was incensed and was determined to follow the thieves downriver. He later explained his motive and his philosophy of frontier justice. Roosevelt wrote, the determining motive in our minds was neither chagrin nor anxiety to recover our stolen property. In any wild country where the power of the law is little felt or heeded, and where everyone has to rely upon himself for protection, Men soon get to feel it is in the highest degree unwise to submit to any wrong without making an immediate and resolute effort to avenge it upon the wrongdoers, at no matter what cost of risk or trouble. To submit tamely and meekly to theft or to any other injury is to invite almost certain repetition of the offense in a place where self-reliant hardihood and the ability to hold one's own under all circumstances rank as the first of virtues. Within a few days, T.R.'s foremen, Bill Sewell and Wilmot Dow, experienced woodsmen from Maine, had, bu had built a new boat, and the three Avengers started down the Little Missouri. Roosevelt was probably the only manhunter of his era to pack a camera as part of his arsenal, in addition to his usual diary and a couple or more books. On the morning of April 1st, 1886, while on this trip, the men killed two deer 
and TR took a photograph of Sewell and Dow standing in the boat with their trophies. This photo site remained unidentified until I discovered it in 2017. It lies just a few miles west of the north unit of Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Knowing this location changed the long accepted theory of where the boat thieves had been captured and how they had been taken out of the Badlands. For the very day this photo was taken, the men suddenly came upon the camp of the, of the thieves who were held up by an ice jam. Putting the outlaws under arrest with no resistance, the party of six men spent another week sitting beside the river waiting for the ice to release. Finally, with their food exhausted, Roosevelt and Dow found a line camp of the Diamond Sea Ranch along Crosby Creek, which was named for its owner, W.L. Crosby. After gaining direction to the Diamond Sea headquarters on the south slope of the Kildare Mountains, T.R. determined he would march the thieves overland to Dickinson, while Sewell and Dow took the boats and plunder downstream to the Missouri and on to Mandan, and thence by rail back to Medora. At Dickinson, T.R. turned his prisoners over to Sheriff Morris Sebastian and was present when they were taken before Justice of the Peace Western Star. Incredibly, Theodore Roosevelt, Western Star, and W.L. Crosby, owner of the Diamond Sea Ranch where T.R. had just found refuge, were all former classmates at Columbia Law School in New York. They all knew each other. Two of the thieves, Mike Finnegan and Ed Bernstead, would each be sentenced to 25 months in the territorial penitentiary, while the third man, Chris Pfaffenbach, would be released at Roosevelt's urging. T.R. explained to Justice Starr that Pfaffenbach was a simple man and was merely a follower of the other two. T.R. recalled that Pfaffenbach thanked him profusely and noted that it was the first time anyone had ever thanked him for calling them a fool. <laughs> T.R. said he faced some criticism for not simply executing his prisoners and saving everyone a lot of trouble. His exertions in bringing these fugitives to justice is also strong evidence against the belief that he had earlier tried to join a band of vigilantes. This worthy pursuit and arrest of the boat thieves did gain for Roosevelt the status of a frontier lawman. In coming years, however, he would embellish his credentials, somewhat shamelessly, often remarking that he had served at various and sundry times as a deputy sheriff. The question remains, was Theodore Roosevelt a legally appointed deputy sheriff? He wrote in 1888, quote, under the laws of Dakota, I received my fees as a deputy sheriff for making those three arrests, and also mileage for the 300 odd miles we had gone over, a total of some $50. Since Billings County, where the boat theft occurred, would not be organized until later in 1886, it was attached to Morton County for judicial purposes. Therefore, the Mandan authorities had paid Roosevelt's expenses. And if he indeed had legal standing as a deputy sheriff at that time, it was under the authority of Morton County. It has been written that Roosevelt held the deputy sheriff's commission by virtue of his chairmanship of the Little Missouri River Stockmen's Association. The origin of this tradition is hard to trace. If true, it was apparently only a verbal commission by a local sheriff, for no written documentation of such authority has ever been found. In 1885, the Little Missouri Group, while still retaining a degree of autonomy, had consolidated with the larger Montana Stock Growers Association. In 1890, Roosevelt resigned from the association, as most of his fellow Dakota ranchers already had done. Yet Roosevelt insisted that he continued to be a deputy sheriff into the 1890s. He recalled the irony of working as a deputy under Sheriff Bill Jones when, at the same time, Jones worked for him on his Elkhorn Ranch. This was not the same Bill Jones who had held up the Mingusville train, but he was a colorful character, widely known as Hell Roaring Bill or Foul Mouthed Bill. He served as Sheriff of Billings County from 1895, 1891 to 1895, when Roosevelt's Dakota visits were short annual affairs devoted mostly to hunting. If Roosevelt carried authority as a deputy sheriff during the 1890s, it must have been a simple, largely honorary, verbal appointment by Sheriff Jones. As noted earlier, no formal documentation of a Roosevelt Commission has ever been found. In a lengthy 1903 letter to John Hay, his Secretary of State, President Roosevelt described his just-completed tour of the West. 
In the letter, Roosevelt reminisced about having arrested two other outlaws. Of the first, he wrote that as he talked on the trip with old friend Seth Bullock of Black Hills fame, quote, Bullock suddenly asked me if I knew what had become of Lippy Slim, a half-breed horse thief whom I had once arrested and handed over to Granville Stewart, who was then acting on behalf of the Montana, Montana cattlemen. I said no, whereupon Bullock responded, well, Stewart hung him. Roosevelt probably never met Granville Stewart until the Miles City Stockman's meeting in April 1886, by which time the Stranglers had long been disbanded. More definitively, extensive and ongoing research has not, reveal, has not revealed the single, the slightest other reference anywhere to a man named Lippy Slim. Roosevelt's other arrest, he said, was, quote, of a rather well-meaning but worthless young fellow named Calamity Joe. Calamity Joe was indeed a somewhat notorious character in Western Dakota during Roosevelt's ranching days. His real name was Joseph Conrad Meyer. And as Roosevelt would point out, Joe's uncle, Charles Dietrich, served as a United States Senator from Nebraska. Roosevelt first wrote publicly of Calamity Joe in 1888 when detailing his arrest of the boat thieves, declaring that as the captors and captives talked around the fire one night, quote, somebody had been speaking of a man we all knew, known as Calamity, who had recently been taken by the sheriff on a charge of horse stealing. Calamity had escaped once, but was caught at a disadvantage the next time. Nevertheless, when summoned to hold his hands up, he refused and attempted to draw his revolver, with the result of having two bullets put through him. This story was true, for Calamity Joe had successfully resisted arrest at Rapid City in the Black Hills in January 1886. On February 12th, he was confronted at Glen Allen, Dakota, by the Sheriff of Dickinson, and he again ran, but this time he was shot twice in the upper, in the left side and hip and was brought to the ground. The prisoner was taken to Dickinson where his wounds were dressed and he was lodged in jail. News of this arrest went out over the wire service and appeared in newspapers across the country, including the front page of the New York Times. One must wonder if Roosevelt at home in New York at that time read about it. Uh, Medora's editor of the Badlands Cowboy, Arthur T. Packard, editorialized on the arrest of Calamity Joe. Packard wrote, It is amusing to read in the Eastern papers that he was one of the most notorious desperados and horse thieves in the entire West. He was known here as a quiet, peaceable man, perhaps a, perhaps a little, <laughs> excuse me, perhaps a trifle weak in the upper story, but with nothing of the criminal about him naturally. Roosevelt had written in 1888 that we all knew Calamity, but he did not claim a role in bringing the young outlaw to justice. That would change dramatically 15 years later in 1903 when he wrote to John Hay, I had also arrested a rather well-meaning but worthless young man named Calamity Joe, who had become involved in horse stealing. I took him down to Mandan, and the night before the trial, he and the judge and I all slept in one room with two beds. And as the judge felt it undignified to sleep with a horse thief, he slept with me instead. It proved afterwards that Calamity was a nephew of Senator Dietrich. Roosevelt did appear in court in Mandan in August 1886 because of his boat theft case, but he did not have custody of anyone. The two boat thieves had been in jail since April, and Calamity Joe had been free on bond since June. The most accurate version of Roosevelt's Mandan trip was undoubtedly the one he wrote to his sister Anna in a contemporary letter from Mandan dated August 11th. Roosevelt wrote, I had to come down here about the horse thieves, or, I'm sorry, the boat thieves. I think I should have had a rather rough time of it had I been obliged to put up with the hotel accommodations, for it was a vile building, entered through an underground drinking saloon and my room contained two beds and two fellow boarders, one of them my old friend, the horse thief Calamity Joe, who's now out on bail. But I fell on my feet as usual, he wrote his sister. Do you remember those two nice Kentucky girls? Well, I met the husband of one of them, Selms by name, and he insisted upon my at once taking up my abode with them, for they have a little house on the outskirts of Mandan as well as a ranch. I have had a really charming time. Well, together I have enjoyed my three days here. Tomorrow I go back to Medora, but return to the trial a week hence, 
when I will again stay with the Selms. I had the boat thieves indicted today. In his 1913 autobiography, Roosevelt again claimed to have arrested Calamity Joe, although he hedged a bit by writing, the man went by a nickname which I will call Crazy Steve. The fact that Crazy Steve also had an uncle who was a U.S. Senator clearly establishes that the man was actually Calamity Joe Meyer. Roosevelt wrote, it was with Bill, Sheriff Bill Jones that I first made acquaintance with Seth Bullock in 1892. Seth was at that time sheriff in the Black Hills District and a man he had wanted, a horse thief, I had finally gotten, I being at that time deputy sheriff, two or three hundred miles to the north. The man went by a nickname which I will call Crazy Steve. A year or two afterwards I received a letter asking about him from his uncle, a thoroughly respectable man in a western state. And later this uncle and I met at Washington when I was president and he a United States Senator. Perhaps Roosevelt felt the need to publicly replace one colorful nickname for another, Calamity Joe to Crazy Steve, because some people would know or would find out he had never arrested Calamity Joe. Joe was arrested only once at Glen Allen on February 12, 1886, and Roosevelt was not there. Whether he actually made such a boast to Seth Bullock, who would have known better, is unclear. Roosevelt was newsworthy, and any arrest he made would definitely have made the contemporary press, if not the official county records. The silence in these sources confirms that despite his later claims, the only arrests Theodore Roosevelt ever made in the West were of the three boat thieves on April 1, 1886. A postscript from 1912 demonstrates that even if newsmen may have been responsible for muddying certain details, the names they recorded came from Roosevelt himself in a hazy mixture of memories. As Roosevelt passed through Salisbury, Maryland in May 1912 during his unsuccessful attempt to regain the presidency, he received a surprise visit from an area resident and an old acquaintance. The press reported, as Colonel Roosevelt's railroad car was on the siding at the station this morning, the Colonel and the Colonel was eating his breakfast, somebody brought in the card of Western Star. As soon as the Colonel looked at it, his face broke into a wide smile. Bring that man in, he exclaimed. I want to see him again. Mr. Starr was brought in. He was a tall, straight man with a high forehead and a clear eye, and he carried in his hand a sombrero that could only have originated on the Western Plains. It was an enthusiastic greeting. Well, Judge, said Roosevelt, how are you after all these years? Do you remember that time I brought the cattle thieves before you? Then Mr. Roosevelt told the following story, showing a remarkable faculty for remembering names. I was a deputy sheriff in the Badlands in those days, and there were three cattle thieves that had been giving us a lot of trouble. I hired two Bronco mares and went after them and rounded them up about 60 miles from Dickinson, where the judge here was magistrate. Their names were Calamity Joe. Billy the Kid afterwards killed him, I believe. Not true. Half-breed Bill and Red. I put them in my wagon and started to walk the 60 miles to Dickinson. I was young and hardy then, and that didn't seem far. Stopped at night, didn't you? said Judge Starr. Yes, I did, and I made those three fellows sleep in an upper bunk where they couldn't get down and jump me. And I sat up all night in a chair and watched them. The next day I made Dickinson and turned them over to the judge here. That's just what you did, said the judge who had followed every word. Now having, quote, a remarkable faculty for remembering names does not necessarily translate to having an accurate memory. <laughs> but it must be said that Calamity Joe was one name that Roosevelt never forgot. <coughs> TR's last recorded reminiscence about his outlaw busting days was at Bismarck, North Dakota on October 6, 1918. He was now 59 years old, and this would be, as it turned out, his last visit to the state. He would die unexpectedly in his sleep three months later. From the rear platform of a Northern Pacific train, Roosevelt, standing beside his old friend Sylvain Ferris, delivered impromptu remarks of a crowd of 2,000 residents who had assembled to greet him. Roosevelt said, I have been pretty much everything. I lived here at a time when this was the great territory of Dakota, and I have even been a deputy sheriff. I never shall forget the time when we spent eight days in the tail of an ice jam, when we came down to Mandan. We had a prisoner, a horse thief, with us, 
He wouldn't sleep with the sheriff, so I had to share him as a bedfellow. Past his prologue and the old has become new. Dickinson has now become Mandan and the judge has become the sheriff. The admiring crowd, we may be sure, did not know the difference and would not have cared anyway. The West of Theodore Roosevelt is perhaps best encapsulated by the, quote, half-breed horse thief he claimed to have arrested, Lippy Slim. We know T.R. arrested him because he said he did, but Lippy was not hanged by Stuart Stranglers. In fact, he never died. He escaped to the shadows, and he still lives in the mythology of the American West. He taunts us from the next hilltop and then the next, and so the pursuit continues. Mr. Lippy Slim would swear to the truth of every tale told by and about Theodore Roosevelt if only we, like Roosevelt, could capture and question him. But as of today, Lippy Slim remains at large. <laughs> Does anyone have any? Thank you. Thank you so much. I got a little long-winded, sorry about that. Does anyone have any questions I touched on or, or even something I didn't touch on? Yes? The biographies that I've read on him, there seems to be some dispute over his great bear hunt, which brought, and whether or not that is where the teddy bear is attributed to. And the question was, well, did he really shoot the bear or was this a publicity gimmick like you have pointed out so many of his other stories and tales right. have been. What did you find or what is your conclusion regarding the controversy of his bear hunt? Yeah, uh, as I understand it, and uh, I, I, uh, when he gets out of Dakota, I'm less well informed, but of course TR went on a number of bear hunts, including when he ranched in Medora. He, he and some of his men went to the Bighorn Mountains of Wyoming. And, there's, and that's not the teddy bear story, but there's controversy there also that uh, uh, whether or not he actually shot the bears that he claimed to have shot or whether the guide shot them. But uh, I believe the teddy bear story originated uh, while he was president, right, uh, in a, a southern state. And I can't remember exactly, was it Mississippi? Mississippi. Mississippi? Okay, thank you. And, uh, and he didn't have any luck, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, didn't have any luck finding a bear. And finally his guides one day caught a mangy little bear for the president and, and actually tied him off to a tree and told Rose Roosevelt, there you go, shoot him. And Roosevelt, being a sportsman, refused. He said, I'm not going to shoot this bear. And of course, newspaper reporters were at hand and they, they really wrote this story up. The president refused to shoot this defenseless bear. And a uh, uh, toy maker, I forget who it was, uh, actually came up with the idea from the news reports uh, to make this bear, which initially was called Teddy's Bear, right, which became modified into Teddy Bear. But that's, as I understand it, that's that's the story that there there actually was a bear, but Roosevelt refused to shoot it, mm -hmm. and, and that's why it became memorialized as a toy. But Roosevelt was a was quite a hunter. I mean, he uh, later boasted he pretty well, <clears throat> over the course of his life, had killed everything, uh, every kind of game that is that, that there was to kill. Well, and but, also his excursion through the Amazon in South America later after his presidency was mm -hmm. there, something I did not know until I started reading biographies that have been written about him and how fascinating he was as an explorer right. in the 20th, early 20th century. Right. And he, uh, that, as you know, if you read about it, that almost killed him, literally. Yeah, that was, so sad. well, yeah, and, uh, yeah, but he, he did suffer apparently from malaria quite severely on that trip, right? And, and men did die on that expedition, and, uh, and he credited his son Kermit with getting him out of there. In fact, the story goes that, and again, uh, uh, you know, there may be a, a little, uh, uh, embellishment there, but he, uh, had ordered the men to leave him behind. He was so sick, he was... He felt he was uh, imperiling the, the other members of the expedition. He said, you know, leave him behind, which of course they wouldn't hear of. But I think, you know, and they say that probably did hasten his death a few years later in 1919. But I've always thought to myself, if, uh, you know, if Roosevelt, if Theodore Roosevelt knew he was going to die in bed asleep, he would have insisted that he be left behind in the jungle. You know, I think if he could have written any ending for himself, it would not have been to die in bed asleep. 
That, that's a great question. I, I've searched for that. There is a reference that he killed more than the one buffalo, but I've, I've never found anything contemporary about that, um, when or where it might have been uh, that he killed one. So uh, as far as I can document, that first one he got in September of 83 was, was, as far as I can tell, the only one he got, at least in our region. He may have got some out of state, I suppose, maybe in Wyoming, when he was on his long hunt in Wyoming. But as far, and, and also the location of that uh, buffalo kill is interesting too. A lot of the books say it was in Montana. And uh, Joe Ferris, his guide, said in 1900, uh, in a newspaper interview, he, Joe Ferris specifically said, the buffalo was shot in North Dakota near the Montana line. So I say that, you know, the buffalo was shot in North Dakota, and most of the biographies and books say it was in Montana. Uh, I think one possible explanation for this is uh, I'd always been confused reading about the military r reports from the 1870s. They always talked about Sentinel Butte, Montana. And Sentinel Butte's a good 10 or 12 miles from Montana. I'm thinking, how could they make that big of a mistake? But I discovered after that that in 1885, uh, I guess when they were getting ready to organize the county, they actually did a, a more professional survey and they discovered that the territorial line was, was 12 miles off that it had been thought the Montana Territorial Line was, was 12 miles to the east, which is where Sentinel Butte is. It, it would dissect Sentinel Butte. And not until 1885 did they discover the boundaries actually where it currently is. So to me, that would explain you know, why the military kept calling it Sentinel Butte, Montana. And it probably also explains, or could explain, why uh, there's confusion as to whether the buffalo was killed in Montana or North Dakota. But his guy, Joe Ferris, said it was killed in North Dakota. So that's what I go by. Yes, Jim. Uh, you uh, said that you discovered the spot where the picture of Teddy Roosevelt holding uh, these, these boat thieves uh, uh, under, with his gun. How did you go about discovering that spot? Well, I, I'd like to channel Roosevelt and say I trudged the river for weeks. But actually, I went on Google Earth one night and found it. <laughs> Uh, that uh, Roosevelt took a series of photos, uh, you've probably all seen them, um, of him sitting around the campfire with the rifle or shotgun, I guess it is, guarding the three, the three boat thieves. And uh, Rolf Sletten, who many of you probably know, uh, wrote a couple of books on Medora and Roosevelt, and, and Rolf went out and discovered that the campfire photos were actually taken at the Elkhorn Ranch. He, uh, you know, Rolf matched the background up and obviously they were taken at his Elkhorn Ranch. So they were staged. And, and Rolf and I and others had debated for several years on, on whether, you know, the, whether they were taken real time or staged later, whether Roosevelt had a camera or didn't have a camera with him on that manhunt. And Rolf uh, found the campfire photos, but he couldn't find the one of Sewell and Dow in the boat. They're standing in the boat along the bank of the river. And, uh, and that's the one in question. And, and I'm, I was still insisting that he must have taken a camera with him. So actually, yeah, I went on Google Earth one night because uh, just going from the photograph, you could tell which way the boat was going because of the mud on the, this side of the boat. Obviously, that was the front, right? They're going this way. And, and the background, the buttes are overlooking the Little Missouri River. So I go on Google Earth and there's only, I started uh, at Cherry Creek where traditionally they say he caught the boat thieves and I just worked my way back and there's only like five or six places where the buttes actually touch the river like that. And, and uh, as you zoom in on Google Earth, it gets kind of fuzzy and distorted. So I was, I'd say I was about 80% sure that, that was the spot. And I told my wife, Mary, the next day, I said, I need to run up there and check this out. So I had a copy of the photo. And, and uh, thank goodness I had a Forest Service map where I'd have been as lost as those guys were. I'd never been in that part of the Badlands, beautiful country. And uh, finally found the spot. It's private land. So I got permission from the landowner and, and walked out there and held the photo up. And there it was, you know, just plain as day. Um, and that moved everything much further west than the, uh, the Cherry Creek thing all starts with uh, Mike Finnegan, one of the thieves who was interviewed in the penitentiary a couple of years later. And he, 
he said they, that Roosevelt got them at the mouth of Cherry Creek, and that's well, everyone has used his reference. Well, I, as I say, Cherry Creek is way to the east of, of where that photo was taken, and, and it was, we know it was taken April 1st because of the dead deer in the photo, and we know they caught the thieves April 1st. So uh, they couldn't have got more than, I'm guessing, eight or 10 miles from, you know, until they caught up with the thieves. So that puts them many, many miles short of Cherry Creek. So that was, that was new information, so that kind of, and there's a photo of it in the book, I'll be shameless and plug the book over there, but I did put a, a modern day photo comparison with the Roosevelt's photo, and that was new information, so I thought uh, that kind of motivated me to, to finish up the, the project. Yeah. Yeah, the, Roosevelt and, and Joe Ferris had to search, well, literally for bu almost two weeks to find a buffalo. And when you, uh, the newspapers are a good source for finding, uh, tracing the buffalo population because uh, 1882 was really the last successful season for buffalo hunters. And they all, uh, you know, the weather uh, closed the season off and they all went back in 1883 expecting to have another season and there were no buffalo. And they, the hunters assumed they must have gone north into Canada. And uh, only later did it turn out they were nearly gone, nearly yeah, extinct. Policy, right? Yeah, it was, never, it was never expressly ordered. You know, you won't find any official records saying that. But, but yes, as you said, Sherman and Sheridan and some of their private correspondence that was never published, you know, during their lifetime, they said this is the only way to get rid of the Indian problem is to get rid of their food source. Uh, so they, they did nothing to stop the hunting and, and may have even encouraged it. Um, there's also a couple of interesting studies done on, on disease though. They think uh, uh, a lot of the longhorn cattle coming up from Texas, it, the demise of the buffalo kind of coincided with the long cattle drives from Texas up to Kansas and Dakota and Montana and they overlap a bit and, and there have been some good scientific studies that uh, that these cattle carried disease, which 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 transferred to the buffalo population and killed them also. So it's probably a combination of hunting and disease that just decimated these buffalo herds. In fact, uh, Kansas and other states uh, would issue quarantine laws. You know, they, they wouldn't allow Texas cattle past a certain parallel uh, because of the danger of, of infecting domestic cattle uh, with the longhorns. And, and they assume, I don't know if it's ever been tested, but the longhorns by grazing and, you know, uh, using the same grazing land as the buffalo transferred these, uh, I guess I don't know uh, what caused the disease, what caused the, what they call Texas fever virus, uh, um, but transferred whatever the bug, whatever it was into the domestic herds and, and including the buffalo herds. So I think it's a combination of hunting and disease. And that raises the irony, too, of Roosevelt being another example of him being somewhat of a contradiction. You know, he came out to kill a buffalo before they all disappeared. Uh, but yet he's famous, rightly so, as a conservationist. You know, he did so much to conserve the buffalo and other species. Um, but yet he, and, and in, his, in his defense, that's the only way they could really study. It wasn't so true about the buffalo, but uh, scientifically study a disappearing specimen was to kill one, right? So uh, the scientists could could gain a study of the of the of the animal. But but he did much to to help preserve them after he nearly helped bring them to extinction. <laughs> yes, sir. In the eighteen eighties, how intensive was ranching in Billings County? Was there lots of ranchers? There, there actually was. Uh, the first ones uh, came, uh, I guess, late eighteen seventy nine. The hash knife outfit, which their headquarters were further further south up to Little Missouri, but they ranged cattle, you know, as far north as Medora, or near in that region in 1879. And then when the railroad came through in 1880, that really opened up that entire country. And, and uh, within a few years, by the time Roosevelt got out there three years later, uh, he had trouble actually locating his Elkhorn Ranch. He, he bought his first ranch actually already existed, the Maltese Cross. He just bought that, 
but he established his own Elkhorn Ranch 35 miles north, and he had to really search to find open range. Uh, and then uh, things went, went great for a couple of years, and then that bad winter of 1886 and 7, um, a lot of the cattle were southern cattle, and, and this bad Dakota winter just decimated those domestic herds. Some of the Minnesota, Iowa cattle did better, um, but that, that put a lot of ranches out of business uh, that, that winter, and, and you never really saw that, that degree of cattle ranching again, as you saw from 1880 to 1886. That was kind of the peak. Yeah. Has that been uh, settled down? You know, I, I haven't, you probably know as much as I, I haven't read much about that recently, uh, but the, help me out here, the, uh, the Forest Service uh, ended up with, with that surrounding acreage, right, but they didn't own the mineral rights, and the guy who owned the mineral rights was going to mine the gravel out of it. And uh, I don't know if they reached a settlement with him, I guess he had every legal right to do that, but uh, I know it, it was... Uh, I just know what I read in the paper about that, that uh, uh, it, it hasn't happened as far as I know. You know, the mining has never actually commenced. So I don't know if they reached a settlement or, uh, or what happened there, but uh, yeah, it's kind of a bad deal to, you know, uh, possess the land but not the mineral rights. Do, yeah. do you do much research about, like, later in Roosevelt's career? Uh, there's a story he was out in Billings, Montana, Okay, you know more than I do, but, but that was his last trip, that October 1918 trip that I conclude with. Uh, yes, he came from Billings through, he came through Medora at night, so he didn't stop, but he stopped in Bismarck, that's where that quote came from, but uh, yeah, I, I don't doubt that a bit, and I know he, he, that wasn't 1918, but he stopped in Beach once, uh, right on the Montana border, I think that was 1910 or 11, and uh, and the press reported a few remarks he made about why why anyone would put a settlement uh, where Beach was, <laughs> and and the the local people took offense. And, he, and Roosevelt says, "What what are you people thinking? You know, putting this town here. There's no water. There's nothing here." And anyway, it was uh, I don't know. Maybe that was a maybe they were playing that up. But but Roosevelt uh, was not afraid to question what he didn't believe in. You know, and, and I, I, I'm sure you're accurate. I'm sure he probably did lamb, uh, lamb kind of, blast it. I was kind of wondering what his, his state of mind was at that time because he died the next year. Right, right. That's a great question. Uh, I'm, I'm a little ignorant on it, but uh, that would be interesting to find out more. Yeah. And I know he, he did become kind of a political maverick right after the presidency. He formed that third party, the Golden Moose Party, the Progressive Party. And, and I, I think he did uh, a lot of his political views kind of kind of became uh, unpopular uh, to, to the mainstream. But yeah, great question. I'm going to try to research that a little more. Thank you. Uh, anything else? I don't want to monopolize your time. Yeah. Did what? No, actually, great question. I, I should have pointed that out. He actually never owned any land. Uh, he, uh, at that time, in the period he came out here and established his ranches, um, ranchers would, would uh, pay taxes on the, the buildings, on the livestock, but none, none of them owned any land. Uh, in fact, the Marquis de Mores, when he arrived, he actually bought title to land, but he was the first and only one for many years that actually bought title to land. And Rose, uh, the Marquis bought, bought his land from either, uh, either the railroad or the government. It was mostly government land. But, but the ranchers, including Roosevelt, um, it was, they were technically squatters. You know, they, they owned the buildings and the livestock, and they paid tax on those. But they didn't own the land. There was just free use at that time. Yeah, and that, that changed about 20 years later, actually. Not until about the turn of the century, about the year 1900, did uh, when the homesteaders started coming in and, and surveyors actually got out there and actually started surveying the section lines. Uh, you know, was it required? If you didn't want to lose your land, you had to buy it. And by then, Roosevelt was out of the ranching business. So, yeah, I never, never actually owned any land, just the buildings and livestock. 
Yeah. What did, what did you find out about the embellishment of the San Juan, of the Rough Riders and the San Juan Hill? And yeah. Cuba? Another great question, and I'm not, I'm not as uh, well read on that, but I, I think from what I have read, yeah, there was a, a little of the Roosevelt embellishment about, uh, about his exploits in Cuba, too. Uh, I can't remember where I read it, and it might be apocryphal, but supposedly T.R. said once the bravest man he ever knew followed him up San Juan Hill. <laughs> it was probably a false story, but, but it, it's too good not to repeat. But, but yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think there was a little embellishment there, too. And of course, that, you know, that springboarded Roosevelt into the, well, the governorship of New York to the vice presidency within a year he was president. So, so that campaign really, uh, really put him where he ended up. But, but yeah, I'm sure there was a little uh, embellishment. I think the press helped a little bit. Uh, at that time, his, his Western uh, Dakota experiences, you know, he wasn't really, he was always interviewed, he was always newsworthy. You can kind of trace his comings and goings. You know, he'd be interviewed in Chicago and Minneapolis and St. Paul on his way to and from Dakota. So you kind of get a, a, a view and the press did help him along, but nothing like the Cuban campaign. I mean, the press really, really made a darling out of him. And, and uh, really catapulted him into into the upper atmosphere. I rose like a rocket, I think was Roosevelt's phrase, and it's actually a title of a book. Speaking of his political life, I rose like a rocket. Yeah. In your research, did you come across any comments he made on the American Indians that he came into contact with? Yeah, great question. And I know the Presidential Library will, uh, I know they want to address this too, and kind of do the warts and all, because he was, uh, Especially early on, um, I mentioned these interviews uh, when he got back to New York in 1884. He'd been out here, you know, less than a full year, and he was being interviewed as kind of an expert on the West. And uh, some of his comments about the Native Americans, the American Indians, are really uh, looking at them from our perspective are really racist. And uh, you know, the library does want to examine this and interpret this in, in many ways. You know, he was a man of his time. That's always important to remember that, you know, we shouldn't attach our sensibilities to, to a past era. But, but reading his comments, I mean, yeah, they, they're defined clearly as, probably even at that day, uh, as racist. And uh, I think he did evolve a bit, you know, it, throughout his life. Uh, uh, and, and his views became more moderate. And, but it's not just American Indians, right? It's, uh, you know, blacks, all the minorities. When he was president, he had a uh, kind of a black mark on his name over the Brownsville incident. I'm not an expert on that, but uh, he ended up uh, discharging an entire troop of black soldiers dishonorably because they wouldn't uh, name names on one of their comrades. They refused, and Roosevelt discharged the entire company of black soldiers with dis dishonorable discharges. Which even in even at that time, 1905, I think uh, he got a lot of criticism for having done that. Uh, so, so I think he did. Uh, as he grew older, I think he did modify his views a bit. But, but from our perspective, uh, he still had a long way to go. But, but it'll be interesting to see uh, the library progress there at Medora and see how they do interpret that and and uh, and learn from it. Yeah. Have you heard any like inside information about how the people building the library are going to uh, have a policy to approach the controversies? Yeah, uh, I don't think anything's been uh, officially set in place yet. Uh, just from talking to some of the people involved, they're, they're kind of going step by step. And uh, I, I did work in a very small way with, with one of the interpretive groups, and, and we, we stress that, you know, that they need to uh, examine the controversies as don't, don't whitewash anything, you know, and, and, and I think we're all on the same boat with that. Uh, right now they're in the, in the, in the development phase. They, they finished the uh, schematic phase, the design. Now they're going, uh, uh, putting that and, and coming up with cost figures for that, as I understand it. So eventually they'll, they'll really zoom in on the interpretive aspect of it. We, we've kind of started that to a degree, but that'll be finalized later. But, but yeah, we're all, the ones who are, are involved, uh, we were all 
pretty, you know, pretty steadfast on, on saying that you need to examine the controversies. For example, the statue they got from yeah. the American Museum of Natural Yeah, History. where that will go, and apparently that has not been decided yet. Uh, you know, the, the story was it'll go at the library, and, and uh, from what I've uh, learned talking to some of the higher-ups, they say, well, that's not definite yet. You know, they, they do own the statue, or it was given to them. I don't know if they bought it or it was given to them. It's in storage. They said someplace. They didn't, I didn't ask. They didn't tell me where it is. But uh, they said that has not yet been decided on whether, if, if, for those who aren't familiar, the New York Public Library, right, had this statue of Roosevelt on horseback, and there was a, an American Indian and a, a black Museum slave. Of thank you, thank you. Uh, on either side of him on foot, and, and, uh, and a lot of people felt that was uh, uh, discriminatory. And uh, so the library wanted it removed, and, and the, the presidential library ended up with it. And uh, in, in a way, I hope it does come out here and that it can be interpreted. Again, I think it's important to interpret these things, not just try to cover them up, but learn from them, you know, interpret uh, the perspective of then versus now. Yeah, 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 agreed, yeah. Um, anything else, folks? Uh, you've been very, very patient and attentive. I appreciate it. Thank you.